All right. Good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to see you all. Hey, dads, happy Father's Day. Um, congratulations for being uh, dads. I know you worked hard for this. I don't think today is as cool as Mother's Day. Moms, you get most of the attention, but happy Father's Day. It's great to have you here. Okay. Yeah, okay, great. All right. So, are you ready to jump in? Um, I have the privilege of being able to finish out our series on How Do You Know? We've covered a lot of ground in this series, and today we get to talk about maybe one of the most difficult things to talk about as Christians in the world today, and that is this question, how do you know what God thinks about abortion? I want to tell you this story. I was um, at work several years ago, and where I was working, we ended up in groups often, and we talked about controversial things, because in a secular workplace, as many of you know if you're working, um, there's different viewpoints and perspectives all over the place, even if they're inconsistent. There's, you know, different viewpoints. And so we would talk all the time about what we talked about last week, like LGBT issues, and we would talk about abortion. And one time we were having a conversation about abortion, and the group kind of splintered off because, you know, sometimes when you're at work, you have to go to work. And um, it, was just, it was just myself and this one other guy. And we were continuing this conversation, and I was talking about all these different things, like, well, did you know... Um, about abortion, that this is true, and this is true, and I was going on, and I didn't realize that the tone of that conversation had shifted the way that it did, until he looked at me, and he goes, you know what, just stop talking about this. I don't need you to say anything else, because I already know what you're saying. He's like, I already can't close my eyes at night without feeling like I've done something horribly wrong, I'm already having trouble sleeping. I already feel like everything is in the shadow of what you're talking about. And so can we just stop? And that moment was a very defining moment for me in this conversation about abortion. Uh, this coworker was 19 years old, and his girlfriend, I think, was 18. And previous to that, they had decided that they weren't ready to be parents. And they were living together, and as things happened, they were pregnant, and they decided to terminate that pregnancy. I was not cautious or graceful in my communication when I was talking with him. And it was an unfortunate lesson for me to have learned because what I communicated ended up being very, very hurtful to him. And so as we talk about this, how do you know what God thinks about abortion? I want you to know that we're going to get into it pretty deeply here, and I'm excited. But I wanted to share with you that part of my story because that really changed my perspective on a lot of things, and you'll see how that kind of plays out. So I want to open up with this. This is a statement from the Christian and Missionary Alliance, the national office, which means any Christian and Missionary Alliance church abides by this. So I want to put this out there right at the beginning so you can see this, that as a Christian Missionary Alliance church, this is fundamentally the doctrine that we hold to. Human life is created by God and is good. Since we are uniquely created in the image of God and formed by God, we hold to the sanctity of all human life. As best we understand, Human life begins at conception. It also lasts beyond death and into eternity. So you know, as a church, as a denomination, theologically, according to God, this is what we will declare to be true always. So now, let's have some fun. God celebrates life. This is awesome. Our God is a God that celebrates life, and let's talk about why. First off, humankind is made in the image of God himself. In the book of Genesis, um, the, first, the first book of the Bible, chapter 1, then God said, after having created everything else, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. 
Theologically, this term in our image is the imago Dei, that as human beings, you and I, we bear the very image of the almighty God who made us. So some of you, though no one else thinks it, did you know that you're made in the image of God? Even some of you weirdos out there, you're made in the image of God. The rest of you normal people are made in the image of God as well. Part of being human is that we bear the imprint of our creator to love, to think, to make decisions, to show compassion and grace, to reveal the incredible nature of the God that we have. So we bear the image of God. Next here, human life begins at conception. This is a big one. This is maybe where this conversation, honestly, it becomes contentious, is with this statement here, that human life begins at conception. I want to look at two things, embryology, which is the scientific study of human development, okay, from the very first moments, and then I want to look at scripture, okay? So, human development begins at fertilization. This is from Keith Moore's book, The Developing Human. Human development begins at fertilization approximately 14 days after the onset of the last menstrual period when a sperm fuses with an oocyte to form a single cell, the zygote. This highly specialized totipotent cell marks the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. I didn't know what totipotent meant, so I highlighted the word and did smart look up. Get this, this is what totipotent means. A totipotent cell, the zygote, is a stem cell that has the capacity to become everything that is the human body. That cell will grow and branch into a nervous system and heart and lungs and brain and teeth and arms and toes and fingers and everything. A totipotent cell, that zygote, is the very first moment where everything about who you are is determined physiologically and genetically. Next, development begins with fertilization, the process by which the male gamete, the sperm, and the female gamete, the oocyte, unite and give rise to a zygote. Biologically speaking, everything that is stage one of human development happens when that sperm goes into the egg and creates a zygote. That's it. Everything that is who you will be physically, genetically, is determined. The hair you have or the hair you lost at 15 and have dealt with. The, <laughs> the gray hair that your wife picks on you for developing at 28 years old, Carrie. Um, <laughs> that's all determined at that moment when these different things will happen. Um, Biblically, the prophet Jeremiah um, is a little concerned about having to tell the nation of Israel all of these things that God is saying, but God says this, to, says this to Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nation. I formed you in your mother's womb. Isaiah says this to the nation of Israel in a different prophecy. He says, thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. This is like a, a name that God gives to Israel, like a, a, uh, an endearing name, almost like a pet name for them. Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. I formed you in your womb. This is just two texts of the, I don't know, dozens and dozens you could pull out of scripture, not to mention stories that elaborate on this in so many different ways about the creation of human life. Human life begins at conception, and it is a very cool, very wonderful, God-given event. Next, human life must be protected and defended in all possible ways. Human life must be protected and and defended in all possible ways. God, with his finger, chiseled on stone this command to Moses. You must not murder. Israel, having that commandment and very, very, very many more 
along that lines, but with more specificity, decided later on in their history that they were not going to serve God anymore. It's happened several times, but on this particular occasion, Jeremiah is giving a prophecy, and Israel had started serving Baal, and Baal worship was really, really bad. And because they have filled this place with the blood of innocence and have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or decree, nor did it come into my mind. See, when they were beginning to worship false gods, when they walked away from the true God, several pagan gods, Moloch, Baal, the list goes on, they required children as sacrifice. And God's ruling on that is it didn't even come into my mind that this degree of depravity would fall upon you as my chosen people. Now, God's not ignorant, right? He, he knows the practices of humankind. Baal worship was a thing. But he says, this is so far off. You are so, so far off on this one. Human life has to be protected and defended in all possible ways. God celebrates life. He loves it. He created it. He made it. He made all of you. He made me. He did this in a really great way. So here's what I want to do. I want to spend some time celebrating life like God does. I want to look at the development of life and see this because it is so, so, so cool. For those of you that would like to fact check me, here are my sources. You can, you can check this, hh76.org, which is a bunch of resources out in the lobby you can see is so cool out there. They put together a list of these statements, and these are the sources they cited. And I'm going to show you several pictures. <coughs> The animated pictures are taken from thebump.com. Some of you have been through thebump.com about 15 times, so you know the size of your baby starts as a little thing, eventually becomes like a pomegranate. The, the fruits are weird. Um, but on thebump.com, um, you can select see my baby in three dimensions, pictures week by week. I love that they say it, see my baby, even starting on week three of conception. So let's jump in. Check this out. Week three. Week three, conception. Um, which is actually baby's first week of life because, um, because uh, the weeks are measured from the first day of your last menstrual cycle. So that's why we're kind of two weeks ahead here. Week three, conception. The baby is smaller than a grain of sugar, but the instructions are present for all that this person will ever become. That's that totipotent cell, all those gray hairs you guys have. All right, determined right there. One, one single form cell. Week four, the baby attaches and burrows securely into the walls of its mother's womb. That fertilized cell travels down and attaches into the womb. And you already have the development of um, all of the life-supplying sources that that, that that baby needs. Week five, the baby's blood vessels and sex cells form. Foundations of the brain, spinal cord, and nervous system are laid. Now, mind you, this is the baby's third week of life, fifth week of pregnancy, but third week of life, and all that's happening. Week six, the baby's heart has begun to beat. Eyes, ears, and lungs begin to form. Real baby right here. It's extraordinary. Week seven, tiny arms and legs appear, as well as the baby's face. The baby's blood is now separate from the mother's blood. So you can see... The yolk sac is getting smaller, and the placenta is growing to provide life. Week eight, tiny fingers and toes develop. The baby's brain is divided into three parts for emotion and language, hearing, and seeing. Week nine, buds of the baby's milk teeth appear. 99% of muscles are present, and brain activity is detectable and measurable. You can actually see brain waves coming off of little baby at week nine. Week 10, the baby begins spontaneous movement and is now well proportioned about the size of a thumb. Every organ is present but immature. The skull, elbow, and knees are forming. Week 11, if prodded, hands and eyelids close. Genitalia become visible, indicating whether the baby is a boy or a girl. 
and muscular movement begins. Week 12. This is the last week of trimester one. The baby's fingerprints begin to form. Nerve and muscle connections have tripled. Eyelids fuse together temporarily to protect the baby's delicate developing eyes. 12 weeks. Week 13. The baby practices breathing and facial expressions, even smiling. The baby can also urinate and stomach muscles can begin to contract. Week 14. This is baby's 12th week of life. The baby is now three inches in length and weighs two ounces with fine hair on the face. The baby is also able to swallow and feels and responds to skin stimulation. And I think that we can say with David the psalmist, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. Man, the work of God in the womb is extraordinary. God celebrates life. Out in the lobby, you'll see a, t- a table set up, and you can actually pick up little models of what a 12-week-old baby looks like. You can pick it up, and you can actually take it with you. There are several of them. That's week 14 of pregnancy. You can take that with you. What God does in the womb is extraordinary. And so I want to make a little bit of a shift here. From celebrating life in the womb, I want to talk about something that God also celebrates in this discussion. And that is that God celebrates hope. I am very aware that there are two groups of you listening right now. There are those of you that hear this and aren't really impacted too deeply by the personal ramifications of abortion. And then there are those of you that this is a very, very personal, sensitive, gut-wrenching, fearful thing to process. That we're talking about this makes you wish you didn't come today. But I want you to know that God celebrates hope. If you've participated in an abortion and you give your life to Christ, I want to talk to you for just a moment. Whether you're the one that's had an abortion, your spouse, sibling, significant other, your child, this web weaves together, guys. Listen, 25% pregnancies end in abortion, which means a ballpark of, you know, 15, 20 of you that will be here today have probably had an abortion. And we need to know this. And this is what I want to tell you. If you give your life to Christ, you are forgiven. Abortion is not an unforgivable sin. Jesus forgives you when you turn your life over to him. The fear that you live in, that this is the thing I can never escape from, I know God can forgive all those other things, and I even believe that, but this, never for me. I want to tell you specifically now, you are forgiven if you give your life to Jesus. Apostle Paul says in Romans, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There is Now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Apostle John would say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And the psalmist says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you, God, whose word I praise 
In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? You're forgiven when you put your faith in Jesus. Even if you've already put your faith in Jesus, you are forgiven when you accept the forgiveness that is there for you. There's no exceptions to that. You can find healing. We talked about this last week. I thought this statement by Pastor Dave was profound. You don't need to talk to everybody, but you need to talk to somebody. Here's the thing with abortion that is confounding to me. It's such a hot public talking point. But then when you participate in it, it drives you to a level of secrecy beyond almost anything else that I know of. Because I think it like fractures your soul apart. It's, we don't often talk about our personal experiences with abortion. And so you don't need to talk to everybody, but you need to talk to somebody. Here's uh, what John also says. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. There is healing for you. If you're a follower of Jesus and you want healing from your participation in abortion, no matter who you are, talk to somebody. Jesus gave us to each other to help each other with these things. You have a wonderful purpose. God is not finished with you just because you've had an abortion or you've participated in an abortion. You have a purpose. God has a will for your life that only you can accomplish. Don't let anybody ever tell you differently. Your life is not over. Your purpose is not gone. Your value is not gone. God has a purpose for your life. The Apostle Paul says, and we know that all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. God is an amazing God, and he is what we call a redeemer. He takes bad, and in his all-powerful, all-knowing nature, he weaves it together in the course of history to create good. And I don't know how he does it, but he takes bad, and he redeems it and uses it for his good purposes. And may I give you just a final note of encouragement. You will see your baby with Jesus. Maybe one of the most powerful teachings of our Lord is that though they don't deserve it because they're sinful, the grace of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross redeems and covers that little baby. And they are now with our Savior forever and forever. We see this teaching in Scripture time and time again. And so in your healing journey, know that you will have the chance to see your little baby who you didn't have the chance to meet while you were here. You will get to be with your baby. So, let's ask this question. What do we do? What do we do as a church? This is a big one. This one's contentious too. What do we do as a church? May I first encourage you to start with understanding. The complexities of every situation that go into the decision to have an abortion or not, the complexities are like insane spider webs that are extremely difficult to wrap our heads around in any given scenario. I would encourage you, start with understanding, not with judgment. Here's the thing. It's easy to make a declaration when it's not you. When it's not you, it is easy to say one thing or another, but reality hits hard 
when it's your problem now, when it's your 14 or 15-year-old, when it's you that's barely making ends meet and now you have a fourth on the way, when it's you who might not know what's going to happen if this pregnancy continues, when it's your friend that had something terrible done to them that they didn't deserve and now there's a baby involved. It is easy to make a declaration when it's not you in that scenario. (coughs) When my second was on the way, Isabel, um, we had found out that we were pregnant and it was uh, maybe a few weeks after that we started having a bit of a complication. There was a lot of bleeding that was happening. Not good, right, when that happens. And so we call, you know, OBGYN, and they're like, okay, you need to get in right now for an ultrasound to see what's going on. Number one, potential, is that, well, the baby either spontaneously aborted, which that process could have started, or an eptopic pregnancy. Eptopic pregnancy is when baby, instead of traveling down the fallopian tube into the womb, implants itself in the fallopian tube. I will tell you how everything snaps into reality when all of a sudden you're facing a situation that you never anticipated facing. What do I do? What is the Christian moral belief on an eptopic pregnancy? 99.999, like one out of a billion pregnancies could potentially deliver. It's almost surely horrible for a mom if a tube ruptures. Do you you take the tube itself, thus just not intention, not, you know, directly, you know, aborting this baby, but the baby kind of dies naturally? There's all these, all these scenarios that I never would have imagined flooded into my mind. And my ethic of this, it's easy to make a declaration, all of a sudden was like, yeah, it really is. Because now, holy cow, it just got real. Praise God, as you can probably hear her from in here, though she's with Miss Marsha, <laughs> things were fine. I want to say this. I actually asked the worship team and everybody that was here this morning, is this too harsh of a statement? They're like, no, I don't think it is. We must be extremely careful to not villainize, belittle, scoff at, mock, shame, humiliate, and dehumanize those struggling with unplanned pregnancy. Unplanned pregnancy is just that. It's unplanned. We do this on accident oftentimes. Sometimes we do it on purpose. And shame on us as a church. But it's the crass, unsensitive Facebook comment that does this. It's my conversation at work with my coworker, having no idea that he had experienced an abortion, that does this. Spitballing facts that don't need to be in an, in an inappropriate context. Unplanned pregnancy is just that, it's unplanned. Kaylee Cameron with Focus on the Family in in a whole um, text about dealing with sinful pregnancy and not sinful pregnancy and mothering, she says this, pregnancy is not a sin. I don't think there's any exception to this. Pregnancy is not a sin. And we should never, ever, ever treat somebody that's pregnant like that pregnancy itself is a sin. It sure does highlight lots of things that could have gone wrong before that. But this pregnancy, if the baby right now that, you, that is in your womb, that is in your daughter or your friend's womb, whatever it might be, that pregnancy should be celebrated, rejoiced over, and, and praised because it is exciting that God has created a human life that has a purpose in this world. Pregnancy is not a sin. The teaching for us, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. 
we need to make sure that we take care of the very least of these. The Roman culture was really bad um, when the half-brother of Jesus, James, was writing to the church. Women and orphans, especially little baby girl orphans, were just societally garbage. They had, like, no value. And so James says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. We have a responsibility to those that are having a hard time with an unplanned pregnancy, with a pregnancy that resulted from whatever circumstances. That pregnancy is not a sin, and we need to make sure we take care of everybody that's involved. So my challenge for you, determine to be used by God to bring hope and to bring healing. Align your heart and your mind to bringing hope and healing to those who are struggling with abortion, with an unplanned pregnancy, with a pregnancy that they don't want. It will spare you from reacting to the Facebook troll comments and may just save your reputation enough to have a life brought into this world through your encouragement and your kindness. I was talking with a friend who had recovered from an abortion. She was pressured into it at 17 or 18, didn't know what to do, didn't get the counsel, and basically an abortion was scheduled for her. And now, 15, 16 years later, she says this, our vote is important, but it is not enough. Clearly, our vote's important because the ramifications of the legal system is some of what's happening in the highest core of the country. So I'm not belittling that, but it's not enough. We must change the narrative of our culture about abortion. This is our calling. Our calling is to change the entire narrative by celebrating how extraordinary it is the way that God makes life in the womb like we've done this morning. But may I tell you, abortion is down here on the chain of events that led to that pregnancy. We got lots and lots of problems to work through as a church and as a culture. Unmitigated, free, unaccountable sex with anybody that you want will result in the abortion problem way down here. A lack of understanding about human sexuality and about human anatomy and about human reproduction and an ignorance and a foolishness within the church and our children and our teens and our adults is hurting this issue. It's part of the problem. Not living to a godly Christian sexual standard. Did you know if everybody was a faithful follower of Jesus and lived like him in all categories of their life, abortion would be almost entirely and completely eliminated simply because of following God's plan for human sexuality. There are so many issues we have to work through, and our job is to change the narrative of our culture. It's a big calling, guys. There's so many factors in this. Talking with our children about sexuality in an appropriate and age-appropriate way, which, might I say, has to be changed relative to the world we live in. Because I will tell you this, there is crazy, crazy stuff being taught at ages you and I would be shocked at in our school system. Different standards that we hold ourselves to and our children to and our loved ones to understanding out on the table in the lobby you'll find um like i told you before like these little babies and i think one of the really cool ways we can we can do this is by bringing light to how amazing life is as we close i want to i have a video story i want to share with you of somebody that is doing something to make a massive difference um in this discussion about what does God think about abortion and is really doing something. And I want to celebrate this because this is a step 
that is taken that is worth celebrating. And this is just one way that the narrative about abortion is changing. And so let's celebrate with me. And you watch this video. This is Patty Chang. She is um, an attender here at the church. And what she and her family do to begin to change this narrative is really extraordinary. So let's watch. So we started our fostering journey actually with kittens and puppies many years ago. And a friend suggested, knowing that we had been fostering, um, whether we would ever want to consider doing newborn babies. Um, there, we didn't know there was a need for that, but apparently there is because the babies can't go into daycare until they're six weeks old. So if there's two foster parents that are working, then it's a hard, a hard situation for them. So since I've always loved babies since I was little, um, we thought maybe that would be a good avenue for me to take now that the kids are getting older and don't need me the same way they did when they were little and I was a stay-at-home parent for that. So um, the, we checked into it and ended up getting certified. So for me, every newborn should be celebrated. I always think of the family is in, eagerly waiting, the uh, parents, the extended family, everybody's so excited, even the church family, they're throwing baby showers and all of that. That's what it should be. Every family is waiting for this baby, but that's not always the case. And sometimes there's no family waiting and sometimes the birth parents are there, but they're just not a safe option for that baby to be, for them to care for that baby. So that's where we step in. For me, when I think about the possibility that this baby that has just arrived on our doorstep could have easily been aborted, it just makes what we do even more rewarding. This tiny little person, tiny, might not even be here if the birth family made the choice to abort, but instead they chose life. And we get to love on these babies and help them start to figure out how to live outside of the womb. They don't always know how to suck the bottle right away, and so we need to sometimes go slow and help them figure out which is the best for them. And that's the fun part for us. So we're very happy to do that. So in our world, we are considered a short-term foster. Um, our, because our niche is newborns, they don't stay as long as some foster families. Um, we've had some babies stay as short as actually two nights, knowing in advance it was gonna be two nights. And sometimes it can be weeks or months. Uh, I think our latest is like, our longest is like five months or so. Um, every situation is different though, so we don't always know, and sometimes we get last minute information, so we just go with it, whatever, you just take it day by day. Um, so one of the standard things we get, the questions typically, well, isn't it hard to say goodbye when they leave, and don't you get attached, and the answer is yes, we do, we know, that's our job, is to get attached. We know we're gonna be very sad when the babies leave us. There's gonna be plenty of tears, but I told my kids way back when we started with the animals that we would cry when they left, and I said, nobody ever died from crying. So we cry our way through it, and we are sad for sometimes a few days, maybe a few weeks, but usually it's a few days. I'm usually the worst, and then we move on and get ready for the next call. I can get excited then knowing that, oh, there's another little baby coming our way sometime. So that makes it all worth it.